I don't know if the uh, a conference will have uh, slides up somewhere. In any case, you can get it from uh, my side as a PDF. Um, I always like to start explaining the range of levels, not a classification into beginner, intermediate, advanced, which makes absolutely no sense, because, of course, every talk covers a range. In, I also like to call the levels by the names given to them in the no theater and later in Aikido and other martial art. There's a phase where you're learning, shu. Uh, there's a phase where you're detaching from the learning into the real world, ha. And there's a phase where you transcend learning, ri. Uh, this talk addresses anything, anybody but the rankest beginner. Uh, definitely all intermediate layers. Uh, if you're really advanced, if you spent a lot of your time and energy thinking about abstraction, you may well get a bit bored, in which case I will not be offended if you leave. Uh, so abstraction is a somewhat abstract theme, so let's make it a bit more concrete. We work, think, and operate on a tower of abstraction. I developed this to uh, address friends who are saying, I don't do abstraction, I program in assembly language. You can't get any less abstract than that. Well, any more abstract. But, you know, assembly language is an abstraction of machine code, which I'm coding there in hexadecimal, which is uh, an abstraction of signals controlling uh, complex uh, integrated circuits, uh, which uh, abstract uh, uh, components built out of gates, which, uh, where a gate is the abstraction of certain arrangement of transistors. The transistor is an abstraction of a certain layout of dopants on a media. Uh, the reasoning in this term is abstraction over the actual particles, uh, muons and baryons and, and photons, that are doing the work. The, the particles are an abstraction of the grid, which is an abstraction of Schrodinger's equation. And I'm sure somebody who's done more serious physics than I could explain to me what is Schrodinger's abstracting on. Uh, so why don't we program directly by tweaking Schrodinger's equation? Why bother with all these levels of abstraction all the way to assembly language? And I'm told there are even higher levels, more distance from, from their model of reality. Well, essentially, we're looking for leverage. Leverage is a term that comes from a physical lever, which lets me move a huge boulder I couldn't possibly move without a lever to amplify my force. Leverage, by metaphor, is used, for example, when you borrow money to invest more than you currently have in your pocket. Great idea, it does amplify things. However, if it goes wrong, as happened, you may recall in 2008 for the leverage in the monetary sense, it can amplify the crash at least as much. So that's why this talk is balancing between singing the praise of abstraction as leverage, uh, warning about the dangers of abstraction as leverage, and trying to give some guidelines on how to do abstractions right to maximize their positives and keep their negatives under control. You really cannot live without abstraction. That actually applies to all of human life and thought but especially applies to what we're all doing, uh, knowledge work. Not necessarily programming. Some of us may use, may well, use uh, programming as a mere tool to do a DNA synthesis or uh, financial wizardry or whatever. But the point is that if you're doing knowledge work, you're using or consuming, not consuming as in once you're done, there are no more there. there still there, uh, so using abstraction layers. And often, a lot of what you're producing on the way to whatever your final goal is, is other abstraction layers on top. Therefore, it becomes a very attractive looking, I could use a slice of that, uh, layer cake. So we can't live without it, but can we live with it? Joel Spolsky, now best known as a uh, 
core developer of uh, Stack Overflow, but uh, even before then he was a well-known blogger and uh, software entrepreneur and so on, expressed once what he called Spolky's Law, which is all abstractions leak. What does that mean? We'll explore that in more detail. It doesn't necessarily mean a dike with a hole and a poor kid trying to stem it. It actually means all abstractions are subject to bugs, uh, excessive load, deliberate attacks. To ward against these, uh, when you use an abstraction, you must understand the levels below the abstraction or you're completely, uh, completely defenseless against the leak. And this was the whole point of Spolky's law. I'm sure you can find, uh, you can find his essay in online is a great writer. Um, but what I'm adding to this is abstraction should leak. Not only do they, they should, in controlled, designed, architected ways. We'll see what I mean by this. Then there's an uh, important aside. Abstraction can slow you down. Everybody will probably be nodding, saying, yeah, if I program too abstractly, my program will be slow. It's not so much that. It's about your mind. Remember, your technology changes all the time. Your mind, not so much. As I keep saying, we are on release 1.0 beta of human beings, and there doesn't seem to be an immediate prospect for an upgrade in sight. So whatever deals with the functioning of your mind is probably something you're going to have to work with for quite a while. So in psychological science, uh, in 2008, uh, McCrea, Lieberman, uh, Trope, and Sherman published Constructual Level and Procrastination. Essentially, it's a well-known fact that remote events are construed mentally at higher levels of abstraction. So um, if you think, uh, what did I have for lunch today? You can probably uh, have it in your mind at a rather concrete level. I had uh, some lettuce uh, and I skipped uh, the, the zucchini, but I had the fish. Um, pretty concrete. If you're thinking, what did I have for lunch a year ago exactly? You, well, I probably did have lunch. It's likely some vegetable and some protein you are inevitably abstracting <coughs> the nature of your lunch, which is remote in time in this case. The reverse also holds, which is a point the scholars established and published in, in psychological science. The higher the abstraction uh, you are construing something, the more likely it is to that you will procrastinate. Uh, that result is well established for undergrad students of psychology. That, remember, whenever you get empirical results about from, from psychological journals and so on, which are well worth reading, you know they will be accurate for undergrad students of that discipline, because those are the only uh, experimental subjects that poor guys can get without having to like shell out big money. So that, that's, sometimes that actually matters. So there's uh, the famous case of the attachment. You know, they, uh, we, it's well established. We tend to value what we have more than what we lack. If that was universally true, there would be no such thing as trait, because each protagonist would value what they already have more than what they could get by an exchange. Well, apparently that only applies uh, to undergrad students and actual traders in the market are completely free of that mental effect. So keep that in mind. Uh, let me very briefly give some example. Uh, if, uh, the, if a task is described as uh, write uh, 500 words essay about today's lecture, students tend to actually do it pretty promptly. If it's about write an essay on a lecture you found very interesting, I mean, it shouldn't take forever to think 
okay, I've had, uh, I don't know, 20 lessons so far, which one was very interesting, but it's just one abstraction level away from today's lecture, which they just heard to, so it's very present, very concrete to them. Uh, a lot more will fail to deliver that essay or deliver it late. That's an established fact. So abstraction leads to procrastination. Is that bad? Well, as usual, we consult the holy text, the Zen of Python, take your, open your laptop, say, open a Python, say, import this, and meditate on it again. Now is better than never, although never is often better than right now, like all Zen oracles and so on, it kind of mysterious. What do these things mean? Okay, here's the context. The first part refers to what I was talking about this morning. Good enough is good enough. Don't wait until some new feature or whatever is perfect. Release it now, have people use it, listen to their feedback, iterate, improve, iterate, improve. The second part refers to a situation where you're forced to keep backwards compatibility. If you add a bad feature, if it's a design error to have the feature at all, you will be way down for years. Even, even when you make a release whose whole purpose is breaking backwards compatibility, uh, like Python 3 was respect to Python 2, you can decide, oh, so finally I get to abolish the worst feature I ever had the idea of introducing into Python, Lambda. Guido was all decided to, to abolish Lambda in Python 3. He got such a surge of hate mail from Python users that for the first time I've ever heard of, in the long time I've known him well, he stepped back and put Lambda back in. You do one of those errors once you're host forever. I mean, I don't think Python is a bad language because it has Lambda, it would be a better one if it didn't have it. But. So, sometimes, you want to procrastinate to the point of never doing something. That's not a bad idea. Uh, sometimes, most of the time, you don't. So to achieve, think concrete. Uh, consider, for example, uh, the Getting Things Done. They, that's the title of the original book. By now, there are a bazillion books, uh, self-improvement uh, courses, and so on. Uh, the, it has many principles to really help you manage your time, but the most important is always have front and center your single next action. There may be a million things you will need to do to accomplish your life changing, universe changing ways, but one at a time. What's the next one? Next single action. Uh, also, in interaction design, user centric design, you don't write anymore, like in the battle get days, uh, user story saying, the user wants to do this and that. The, the user needs to access this information. You design personas, specific, almost caricatural users your software will have. Like if it's a trading software, there will be John, the newbie trader with vast video game experience. So you can already start imagining he wants fast action, a lot of graphics, uh, uh, information overload. On the other hand, there's Mark, the seasoned trader from Hammurabi's time. He's still grumbling that he can't use the cuneiform characters on clay tablets. So you will be designing for John and for Mark and for a collection of personas. These, this artificial concreteness, if you will, will guide you to do your design best. Or as Jason Fried of 37 Signals put it, you'll find I often quote 37 Signals because they're kind of super design guys, which is a skill I absolutely lack, so I kind of revere them from afar. Prefer action to abstraction. That's, if you have to choose, be concrete so you can do something. They, what you probably thought when I said abstraction can slow you down, is the so-called abstraction penalty. Uh, Stepanov, the architect of the C++ standard template library, published a very learned paper showing that C++ allows uh, you to program at lower abstraction, higher abstraction, 
and there's a penalty, as in extra runtime spent, if you program at the higher level of abstraction. However, this is not a fundamental rule. It's an issue, a detail of quality of implementation. I, I believe in the latest C++ compilers, it doesn't really hold anymore. Uh, it's taken decades, but they're implementing things right. Um, in fact, in Python, we should be usually thinking of an abstraction, abstraction bonus. Consider, for example, uh, what I personally consider Raymond Hettinger's, I don't think he's around anymore, but he gave us a wonderful keynote yesterday, uh, ITER tools. Uh, if, say you just want to do nothing 42 times, they doing nothing is a bit of a strange thing, but instead of the past, you can have something else. But what's the overhead of your looping? Well, you can try range, you can try X range in Python 2.7, happens to be a bit faster. By the way, all these are measured on this old MacBook Air. If you have a faster machine, everything will be faster in proportion. The fastest way, by a little, is actually to use ITER tools repeat. It doesn't tell you, it doesn't give you increasing number, it just gives you none 42 times, but it does that. Uh, does that a little faster than even X range. There's issues of abstractions in Python where the advantage is even bigger, like orders of magnitude. This is, for example, I've got a string and I want the reverse string, exactly. So the detailed, concrete way to do it is to do reversed, which gives you a generic uh, sequence, join it up uh, with empty string, and that works, and, it, and for the string being abracadabra, it takes 113 microseconds on this machine. Uh, but if you do it at a higher level of abstraction by indexing, slicing to be technical, with what uh, my wonderful wife Anna once dubbed the Martian smiley, that is square bracket colon colon minus one. So from to stride. From nothing, thus beginning. To nothing, thus the end. Stride minus one, so going reverse. That takes six times less. The higher abstraction level gains you a huge speed up. Well, huge. It's a microsecond uh, and something. But on the other hand, that's uh, what the thing is taking. So don't be, summarizing this part, don't be worried about uh, Python being slower if you, re if you program abstractly. That's probably not be the case. Just wonder about not procrastinating for being too abstract yourself. Remember, Python 2.7, and even better, Python 3.5, I haven't tried 3.6 yet, it's in alpha, uh, are evolving technology. They keep getting better. You're not. You, you want to get better a bit, but uh, you do have a brain that works, uh, that it was evolved over a million years uh, in of ancestors roaming the savanna, hunting and gathering, and that's not easily worked off. So let's come to the old abstractions leak. Uh, that's how all abstraction leak is Spolsky's law. I'm trying to explain, okay, why? Why can't I make a perfect one? Well, all abstraction leak because all abstractions lie, inevitably. As one of the great engineers, of the 20th century, Korzybski said, the map is not the territory. Jorge Luis Borges, who one of the great uh, writers of the century, actually made a beautiful short story explaining why. Because if the map were the territory, it would completely cover the whole state, letting no sunlight go down to the crops and the, the uh, Harvest would fail and everybody would be starving. The map isn't and cannot be the territory. It has to abstract a lot. So therefore, it lies in some respect, and therefore, inevitably, it will leak. 
it will not correspond perfectly to what it's trying to map. If it did, it would be completely useless. It would be just a copy of the underlying level of, of abstraction. So before you can abstract, you must understand every detail. I use the verb grok, founded by one of my favorite writers and Anna's, Robert Heinlein. It means to drink really deep, to enjoy and get every drop of your drink. Before you can step back, in a sense abstraction is stepping back, you must be close. And this is actually a quote from a rather more unusual source, the Book of Five Rings. Even if you're got zero interest in Aikido or any other form of fencing, the Book of Five Rings still has a lot to teach you. And this is what? Before you can, he's talking about, well, at one level, it is talking about an Aikido duel and the crucial move of stepping back. Before you can do that, you must be close to your adversary. So you must have been close before you can afford to step back. But it is also, that's why I recommend the book as general reading, uh, it, there's also always a more abstract metaphorical level. Before you can abstract from something, you must have been close to that. You can only abstract when you know all details. You can never know all details. That doesn't mean therefore never abstract, which would be in Aristotelian logic, in this more uh, Eastern form, it uh, therefore always keep a very humble attitude. You are doing something that's uh, not in your powers, but you must do it anyway. So be very humble, be very flexible, listen to feedback and be ready to correct your course. Let me take my very favorite abstraction if, uh, in the technical field if I only had to choose one. The TCP IP family of networking protocols. It's really a great abstraction. How the uh, layers correspond to the data or, or payload and, and get enriched with headers and, and footers in some cases as they navigate through lower, more concrete layers. So if all abstractions leak, as I claim, or, or uh, Joel does, Joel Spolsky does, what does TCP leak? Well, to be sufficiently generic, it leaks trust. It was designed in the era of uh, brave-hearted, uh, spotless knights uh, and evil overlords and nobody had any trouble distinguishing them. Uh, the whole stack leaks all, all over the place. Uh, from below, ARP caches are subject to poisoning. From above, DNS caches are subject to poisoning. From the side, BGP can be mendacious. From inside, sniffing is possible. Uh, the tra most traditional application protocols like FTP and Telnet sent passwording clear where anybody happening to listen could get your passwords. And it goes on forever. Um, this is actually rather dated. I couldn't find an updated one. But this is what network managers are worried about. The green on the right is uh, bot and botnets, so essentially the, uh, distributed denial of service attacks. Everything else is actually TCP leaks, leaks of trust. Uh, everything from uh, BGP hijacking, including accidents, and so, and so forth. Um, don't know how familiar you are with network, but ARP, the address resolution protocol, is how lo a local network uh, manages messages. Every, uh, everybody's keeping a, a map of uh, uh, internet protocol addresses to uh, the, lo the machine address, MAC. Uh, and there is no authentication or validation of that. It's not really feasible the way it was designed from the first place. As I mentioned this morning, one thing you have to have from the start, because retrofitting it drives you crazy, is security. 
So ARP, to this day, hardly has any, any security. So if Eve, the evil, Eve for evil, uh, has a faster machine, it can respond to all requests for ARP identification, saying, me, me, that IP is my Mac. And that blocks Alice's slower machine from actually giving the real Mac. So anything on the local network that's meant for Alice goes to Eve instead. Uh, from the outside, you can do the same for DNS, since you're not originally communicating to an internet protocol address, but to a DNS name, uh, you risk somebody interjecting, I am the authoritative server for uh, this domain and the proper IP is, which is his own rather than the one it should be. Uh, this is an actual diagram of uh, border gateway protocol attack, uh, court mandated attack in 2012. Uh, Pakistani court decided that this uh, YouTube thing was an insult to Islamic value and ordered ISPs in Pakistan to block YouTube, which is, of course, was at the time uh, transmitting from California. So how they do that? Uh, they came up with an idea. Well, let's uh, steal their network ranges by hijacking the border gateway protocol locally. Unfortunately, the local hijacks that was sending all YouTube traffic to a local black hole leaked accidentally, presumably, to, I think, Hong Kong and from them to all the world. And for about two hours, all traffic uh, to and from YouTube was actually going to a black hole in uh, somewhere in Pakistan. That's, uh, so BGP is fortunately obscure enough. I mean, let's be serious. Who of you could program a BGP server? Great, we have one expert. So you see, uh, it, it has been and is continuously being improved. It's much harder at the lower levels like ARP. So we will never be without leaks, even in a wonderful stack of abstraction. However, leaks may be good, especially when they're carefully designed for a purpose. Suppose I want to make a remote distributed file system. Um, <coughs> an early attempt, and we're talking decades ago, was, oh, I'll just have to emulate the local one. No reason to do anything different. The problem is the less local your uh, file system actually was, the costlier was the abstraction. <laughs> from everything from semantics to locking to reliability. I don't know how many of you have fought with trying to make record locking work on NFS. Uh, let's say it's not fun. The point is that file system is a splendid abstraction. Local file system is not. It's a concrete thing. And don't subclass concrete classes is a great principle of object-oriented programming, but it, as you see, we're talking about a higher level of abstraction. It applies there, too. The other is Har, um, principal engineer at Google. Uh, he's, he's unfortunately taken down his blog, but thanks to the Internet Archive, you can just web browse for don't subclass complete classes Har, and you'll see he, he's talking about Java, but really half of what he's saying applies perfectly well to Python or even to architecting a file system. The fact that uh, emulating a uh, local file system with a distributed one is a horrible idea doesn't mean the abstraction is a bad thing. You should abstract the right thing. That is, have a file system abstraction and deliberately leak, for example, with methods asking or telling the file system something a local distributed file system won't work, like set a timeout. You pres your local file system presumably doesn't have a way to set a timeout because, hey, it's a local disk, a spindle on my own machine. How, take a millisecond, a, mm, 10 microsecond, why would I need to time out? Well, because maybe it's not. If it's a distributed one, it could be somewhere in Australia and the connections are slightly slower. So you need systematic and usable leaks. And of course, in the 
local file system, their implementation will be trivial, so it will accept a timeout parameter, and for example, it could ignore it, no problem. So I would really like to teach you how to abstract write, but it's a bit too hard. I'm not quite sure I have fully understood. So I'm definitely going to teach you what I'm much more expert. How, to, how do you abstract wrong? Well, first of all, you want to make an abstract interface. Well, you have one class that works just fine. Let me make that interface by essentially abstracting everything that class does. I guarantee you this will surface some implementation detail that are not conceptually part of the abstraction. Uh, subclassing concrete classes, as Har warned against, is also pretty much that. The concrete class is never going to be the right base for subclassing because it's always uh, has implementation details by, by being concrete. Make the abstraction of the multiple classes that need to implement the same interface. Uh, at a middle scale, you can have encapsulation error. For example, in uh, the um, Microsoft MFC library uh, all throughout release four, uh, each Windows had a private member, which was a toolbar class that Windows would use, which meant if you wanted to use, to customize a toolbar, you were completely out of luck because you essentially had to copy the whole Windows class and uh, to edit the um, thing. Uh, th when you get larger scale, uh, uh, has anybody ever heard of Taligent? Taligent was a joint venture between Apple, IBM, and I believe Hewlett Packard in the early stages to make the world a better place by doing a lot of frameworks. A lot of those frameworks were based on others' experience with one application in that field. You can guess how well that went down and how long Taligent lasted. Okay, I will actually try to mention how to abstract well. Uh, you have to master at least one or two layers below the one you're designing the abstraction at to understand uh, how is, in, in several ways that abstraction could be implemented. If there's only one way the abstraction can possibly be implemented, it's not a real abstraction. It masquerades as one. It's really as concrete as the only possible implementation. So better be deeply familiar with several possible implementation. It's best if you also think from the other side. Several intended uses. How are different systems going to use this interface, this abstraction? You can't afford any blinders or shortcuts saying, oh, I don't need to care about the users. I'm focusing on my abstraction. I don't need to care about the implementation. I'm fo focusing on my abstraction. You do need to care both on the above and below. Remember, you can be the next user of that interface. You can be, that's possibly even more likely, the next implementer of that interface. Once you've implemented and published your wonderful interface, well, you need to put code where your mouth is and actually implement it. Uh, the golden rule, doing to somebody, not doing to somebody else what you wouldn't want to be done to yourself is actually a core principle of software development. When you design an abstraction, think of yourself as the next user and next implementer. Uh, and I so strongly recommend the old uh, wiki at uh, c2.com for a deeper discussion of this very thing of issues. But that sounds like a really, really hard job. I mean, I, I should be looking at implementation and users. At, well, you, if, uh, according to Donald Knuth, you can. Uh, that's an interview we gave to the Dr. Dobbs Journal. The psychological profiling, oh, you actually use the term computer scientist, but I don't, I don't like to insult people by using the term. Uh, let's say a good software developer is mostly the ability to shift level of abstraction, low level to high level see something in the small, see something in the large, and a great software developer sees things simultaneously at the low level and the high level of abstraction. In other words, the microcosm is the macrocosm to get all cosmic on you. 
there's uh, wonderful books on that subject, but they tend to be in the exoterica section of the, library, of the bookstore rather than the technical one. But it still applies to the design of abstraction. And just to quote, not for the first time, Jason Fried, you really have to do this homework. He's talking about copying, explaining in that, at that URL, uh, the problem with copying is that copying skips understanding. Understanding is the way you grow. You have to understand why something works, why something is how it is. If you just copy it, you don't. You miss the understanding. You're just repurposing the last layer, not understanding the layers underneath. In other words, it's not ever going to be any good. He's talking about copying, but you know what? Use existing level, high-level abstractions blindly, even though it probably violates no copyright law, no nothing, but still, if you don't understand why is it this way, how does this uh, help the implementer or the user or both, then you're not understanding, you're not growing, you're not getting a, re a real education. So Jeff Atwood, uh, the partner of Joel Spolsky in the foundation of uh, Stack Overflow, put it, don't reinvent the wheel unless you plan on learning more about wheels. In which case, it may be a painful experience when you have your first attempt, but by the time you've made it round again, you understand why. Uh, the, the distance between the point touching the, the ground and the help is, is, is constant. Uh, one good example of uh, uh, hacks of uh, deliberate leak inserted in an architecture is in Google App Engine, specifically the Python version thereof. And unfortunately, not quite as familiar with the many other languages supported. Essentially, everything that's happening in App Engine goes through a layer of remote procedure calls to the uh, servers, to Google servers, which supply the various services, data store, um, user identification, everything. Uh, that neat funnel architecture has already been used ever since the very first days of App Engine to uh, offer a local development server, which essentially runs exactly all the open source part that's above the RPC, but simulates the RPC locally, so it serves it locally, so you can do your development without bothering to upload uh, code to Google all the time. So let's focus on that RPC. How do you, for example, do testing? Everything is going through, specifically, uh, the make sync call function in Epiproxy stub map. The traditional and wrong technique is to monkey patch it. So you get the actual call, you write your own fake, which for example does more logging or, or measure times or lets you control interactively, and after doing all that, it goes back to the original and you put, uh, you monkey patch the fake uh, in here. You will note that the monkey is actually very sad. You may wonder why. Isn't this neat? No, it isn't. Take, for example, the memcache client object. The memcache client object has the make sync call at, as the default value of make sync call. This is like all, all default values are computed once at def time. So the moment mem, the memcache client object is imported, the, the module containing this is imported, the make sync call is fixed to the real one and all your monkey patching after the fact will never change it. This is the crucial bit, and it's very normal. When Guido van Rossum 
for a few years, joined Google to work on App Engine, he came up with a better idea. Hox. Deliberately have a pre-hook and a post-hook, actually, for every, you can have the pre-call and the post-call hooks to every, every uh, uh, function there. And that's a systematic leak around the API calls. What if you don't have a natural funnel such as an RPC? Look at your application, look at your architecture, you'll find some. There are going to be key semantical bottlenecks. For example, if you query a database, consider uh, adding systematically a pre-hook, a, a chain of pre-hooks, uh, which accept the SQL and may modify it, or post-end, post-hooks, which accept the results and can modify them. Uh, if you have an asynchronous architecture, events and callbacks are great uh, semantic stopping points. Uh, it's the pre and post hooks approximate the design pattern observer. Uh, template method is a bit rigid, but you can use it. Uh, look at the, two, the Python 2. Python 3 has changed things a bit, implementation of the Q class. But uh, the one I have time to cover is designed for this purpose, it's the design pattern dependency injection. Um, for example, say you have, you want to make a scheduler, so you add event by pushing something on a priority queue, and when you run, you get the thing, wait until it's appointed time, and then make it happen. Uh, the priority queue, by the way, is an obvious construct on top of uh, the heap queue module, I don't know why. It was never added, it should obviously have been. So that's a nice abstraction, however, you have a problem. How do you test this without long delays? Well, the problem is, uh, or how do you integrate it with other event loops? Uh, the thing concretely depends on the time sleep and so on calls. So you could hatch it with monkey patching which is a subtle hidden communication via dark alleys, or you could use dependency injection. Do you recognize this from the point before where I explained why not to monkey patch? Just use time time and time sleep at the default values, and then save them up, just like SCED in Python 2 standard library does. And dependency injection is a great way to hook. This is, for example, a fake time, which just is for testing. A sleep just advances the fake time indicator. And this is where we see the exact same code again, but this time we understand why this is done. So you can do dependency injection into the API call. If the hooks aren't enough, you can use dependency injection. And this takes us to Q&A. Again, this is, I don't know why I forgot the HTTP in this case, but it's always there. Uh, incidentally, this URL is where you can get the early release of uh, the third edition of Python in a Nutshell, which I'm writing together with my wife, Anna, and Steve Holden, the uh, inventor of PyCon. And what you get there is eBooks, because this way, uh, about once a month, you can, you can uh, get updates all the way until the final release, which may be at the beginning of next year. Um, you get all formats pub, uh, uh, of eBooks uh, from PDF uh, to uh, Mobis uh, to EPUBs. They're all DRM free and guaranteed to stay free of DRM forever, and if at checkout you apply the discount code OTHD, which stands for author discount, uh, you'll get a 50% off on, on that. And the big deal is that if you do that, you get to send us feedback in time for us to react as deeply as appropriate. If you wait to buy the paper edition and 
point out some problem there. We may do some minor fixes, fix a type or something in errata, but that's about it because the whole structure of the book is by then set in paper, which isn't quite as bad as being set in stone, but pretty much. Uh, if you send us feedback now and you convince us that we should change something deeply, we have months of time to do so. So please get or pirate, I haven't said that, no. uh, copies of this and send me feedback. Thank you so much. So we have some time for questions. Thank you. Um, anyone who is designing abstractions, I think, should hear your talk or see your slides, and that would be great. I'm using some libraries that other people have written who haven't seen your slides yet. And so sometimes I'm faced with a choice between monkey patching, subclassing a concrete class, um, or you know, copying or doing something else awful. Um, I don't know. Thoughts? If uh, those are open source libraries, uh, remember the nuclear option, fork. <laughs> if they're not open source libraries, uh, I'm sorry for you, but uh, there's nothing I can do to help. <laughs> Other questions? So thank you very much for your talk. Um, I have a question about dependency injection. I generally don't like to use dependency injection because I feel like it ends up polluting all the signatures of all my functions and the classes definitions and so on. Is there um, some way around it that's clean and elegant in Python they would recommend? So consider how does this pollute the signature compared with one where you were not able to customize this? A dependency injection must always come with, by definition, it's part of the pattern, with a default value. You just don't need to use dependency injection in a certain case, you don't, which is probably not the normal case in operation, in production, you just don't pass it. But this is there for your tests. And occasional weird needs, where you need to hook up in, uh, for example, a scheduler to, I don't know, uh, a QT event loop or something, which isn't something you, you do every day. The, the signature could perfectly well end with the self, and in that case, you would not be able to do dependency injection when you need it, but you can still call it without any arguments, and that'll be fine. I just wanted to add to, to that that generally uh, dependency injection uh, can be replaced with registry. Um, if you look at the Martin Fowler site, he's a Java guy, Java promoted dependency injection with Spring. Uh, he also lists uh, a registry as another way of doing the same thing. Um, in Python community, if you look at the old ZOAP packages, you will find that you can use interface, register utility that provides that interface, and then provide your own and register instead of that one to, so to get a different behavior. Uh, registries tend to be global objects. Yes. When I can avoid globals, I avoid globals. Hi. Um, I was wondering, what do you do when you don't have the ability to pass on your um, dependency, dependency injected object? For instance, you're calling some other library, which might have like you uh, referred to before, might have cached the original time.time .time and time.sleep here. So essentially, uh, if I'm calling an intermediate library which doesn't support dependency injection, uh, and the dependency injection is needed on, on the lower levels, uh, that's when I, if the lower levels are supporting dependency injection and an intermediate uh, layer of abstraction is suppressing that, uh, we'll go back to the, advice to a previous questioner. Uh, offer a pull request to improve the intermediate library. If they don't accept it, consider forking it. Well, I think we're three minutes past the scheduled. I ending. think we have two minutes. Okay. Last question? Okay. 
Hi, just curious, uh, how do you feel about syntactic macros like MacroPy as an abstraction and an alternative for dependency injection? Um, I've uh, I used macros back in the days when I programmed in Scheme. I thought they were the cat's pajamas until uh, I started debugging macro using buggy code. By now, I've been one of those who fought really, really hard against ever having macros in Python. I, I like what you see is what you get. And the point of macro, macros is making sure that what you see is not what you get, so not particularly friendly. I, I realize they sound like an awesome idea until you start trying to debug with them. Another concept I got fell out of love with very deeply is code generation. Hey, why do I have to code all this SQL? I can just strike, write or use an object relational mapping. Sure. Now try having a bug and debugging machine generated SQL code. Wahaha. Sorry. I'll I'll write SQL. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's all the time we have. Thank you all very much for your attention, and uh, see you at the next talk. <laughs>